Welcome to Dylan with Sid Meier's Civilization 4 Colonization. This video is edited, gameplay, commentary, and discussion, and all the silences and time spent thinking have been removed so that the video can be concentrated gameplay, basically. This is the remake of Colonization built on the Civilization 4 engine, and it's a remake that has gained a lot of criticism from fans, although it did get some pretty good ratings from the typical mainstream reviewers. Although I would say that mainstream reviewers in general cannot really be trusted. I decided to play this remake of Colonization because I myself have had some criticisms of it in the past, and I prefer to play a modified version of it that was built by the players themselves. But since I had just finished a complete playthrough of the classic Colonization that everybody seems to love, and I had never actually finished before, I've decided I'm going to go ahead and finish this game, which I've also never actually finished before. And while we play, we're going to discuss the question of, is this game actually any good? I think one of the biggest criticisms of the remake of colonization is that it only contains four different colonies. It does give you the option of having two different leaders, much like Civilization 4 has two different options for most of the civilizations, and each of these leaders has their own benefits. The theme of colonization is still present. The Dutch are still the economic powerhouse, the English are more about immigration, the French are all about trading with the natives and being more kind to the natives, I guess you could say. And the Spaniards are all about killing everybody, specifically natives. We're going to play as the Dutch this time around. Last playthrough I did the French and the classic colonization, this time I'm going to play the Dutch. And specifically, I'm going to play as Adrian van der Donk. He has mercantile, so market prices are less sensitive, and charismatic, plus 100% time between tax increases. We're basically going to start off a little less powerful, but we're going to snowball a lot faster than most of the other colonies. However, because the play now feature doesn't allow you to choose the sea level, I'm going to choose the sea level low in custom game instead. We're also going to be playing on revolutionary, which is the hardest difficulty, and kind of a difficulty that you need to play on if you really want to be challenged by the foreign colonies. If you play on the lower difficulties, especially normal for instance, or whatever they call normal in this game, the enemy colonies are not very aggressive at all, so they're really pushovers. Now I think one of the biggest issues that the remake of Colonization has is that it actually lacks a lot of aesthetic as well as that feeling of character in the game. You can read all this if you'd like to do so, but basically it just says that we found a colony and that we have to declare independence from the motherland after attaining at least 50% rebel settlement in all of our settlements. So the remake of Colonization is actually a lot faster than the old classic Colonization. You have 300 turns in this particular game to declare independence. And here we have the first issue, I think, of colonization is the continuing lack of character. So in the original classic colonization, when you discovered the new world, you actually got a little pop-up that said, we found a new world. And when you meet the natives, you would also get a pop-up, as well as other pretty interesting bits of lore and art that you would get to see. So you have 300 turns to declare independence. After that, you have 100 turns to win. The only issue is that you really have less time than that because you're also competing with the other Europeans. If they declare independence before you do, and they win the war against their king, and they do have to actually fight a war against the king in this remake, in the classic version, they don't have to fight a war against the king, they just get independence immediately. If they get independence first, after winning the war, you lose. So that's something that you really have to watch out for. Typically though, the AI is pretty terrible at winning their wars, especially on the harder difficulties where the Royal Expeditionary Force gets bigger faster as you generate Liberty Bells. Anyway, I'm considering building a colony here, in the remake of colonization, when you build a colony, you cannot abandon a colony. You can do it in some mods of this game, but not in the vanilla version. So if I build a colony, I have to keep it with at least one colonist there all the time. If I turn on the yields, I can see that I can get lumber, furs, and tobacco from the surrounding forest, as well as have access to some cotton here on these plains. I can of course chop down some of these forests to further improve the land if I would like to, but unfortunately there is no special resources here other than the crabs which I can have displayed. They just give more food. They don't even give as much food as the fish, which is five by default. We'd only get four here. I do think that I would like to build this colony here because we need to start settling pretty fast. The game runs pretty quickly and we're playing on the hardest difficulty, so we're gonna be up against the clock, especially in terms of the other AIs declaring independence as well. Let's go ahead and let's sail a little bit further north first and take a look over here. So this looks like it would be a pretty good ore mining site to get or and to make tools from. Let's offload our pioneer onto this tile. Hmm, we've also got sugar there. 
So building the colonies right next to each other isn't particularly advisable. I could build the second colony right here, and then I can use the surrounding tiles that are touching it. In colonization, unlike civilization, you can only use the surrounding eight tiles that are touching your colony, at least in this vanilla version. This land is native land, apparently held by the Cherokee, so I'm going to found this colony first to take their land from them peacefully. They won't ask me about it. Since we're a small band of nomads, they welcome us to partake of the land around us. What shall we name this colony? Let's call it Remembrance. And within this colony, let's see what we would like to do first. There's nothing in particular that this colony has access to in order to produce goods from, aside from maybe the furs. And we actually need to take a look at what is selling and buying in Europe. So let's take a look at that first. We'll set up a temporary choice of a dock. Going back to Europe, you may notice that this screen is very bland. And this is the old screen. They look pretty different, don't they? So right now it looks like furs sell for four, tobacco sells for four, sugar sells for five, and furs sell for four. So right now it looks like cotton sells for three, furs sell for four, sugar sells for five, and tobacco sells for four. This game is all about producing goods, selling them back to Europe or the natives until they run out of money, and in this game the natives do run out of money. And they don't really regenerate money, so once you trade with them, you can't really trade with them more, unlike in the classic, which is another mark against the game. For manufactured goods, we could sell cloth for 8, coats for 12, rum for 9, or cigars for 11. Coats are the most expensive, so it would be reasonable to focus on coat production. So I'm going to switch this colonist over to fur trapping. We're going to build up some furs, and then we're going to put him into the fur trader house to produce coats. You might want to notice here that we only produce three food on this tile. This is different from the classic colonization in that once you plowed the colony square of the colony, it would usually produce four food, which means that you could sustain a second colonist. Because of that, we're kind of incentivized to found a second colony, although we don't get any liberty bells or crosses automatically. So let's go ahead and I think we can found our second colony right there. You can't found right next to each other, but I believe that you can found two steps away. But before that, let's take a little look further north to see what's up here. I want a good sense of what's in the area. And we've met the English already, who are north of us. One of the things about revolutionary difficulty is that the other AI are automatically upset with you. So there's a good chance that the English will have founded a colony up here, or they may actually found a colony right here. I could move up by one and found a colony on this hill, which would give me access to the crab, and that would take these tiles which would mean that my next settlement would probably be on the ancient ruin right here, which is basically Goody Hut, and we're going to want to be exploring these as soon as possible. Or I could destroy this settlement and settle the fish, basically. So theoretically, if I settle here, using Alt-S to mark, then I would want to settle here next, but then that leaves this stretch unused. So no matter what I do, I could settle there, but that would leave this tile unused. I might as well settle here, because if I settle here, that reduces the overlap between the colonies. I could settle another colony in between, but that's not very intelligent in my opinion. Settling on the hill would also make the city a little easier to defend when the War of Independence comes. So let's actually move up by one. We'll gain access to the crabs and the fish. Settling on a hill will only give us, I think, two food in the colony square, but we only need two food since we'll have access to plenty of food from the ocean. And we'll have access to potentially cutting down this forest to produce food, or just shipping food in. The forest we'll probably just leave alone for lumber, and to provide a way to trap the Royal Expeditionary Force when it lands, and our units have, like, ranger promotions. Combat in this game is still very much based on the civilization method, where your units die if they lose the battle. Unlike in the original colonization, where if your units lost a battle, then they would actually just lose their equipment, and you wouldn't lose the unit entirely. Because of that, oh, we have to actually pay money here, hold on. Let's see where the natives are at. There's one there, there's one there, and there's one there. Oh, okay, that's a little concerning. Okonas Data is actually okay with us at the moment. If we were to take his land, he would declare war on us pretty rapidly. Looking at his leader page, he is impressionable, which means that he has doubled native conversion rate from missions. You can find missions in this game that will generate converts over time that will join your colony. You cannot attack a mission and generate converts as far as I know, that's not, that's not how that works anymore. His units get a free promotion, which is Grenadier, which means they have plus 20% settlement attack. He's also gracious, so he gives double gold at first European contact with native villages. 
and his units get Ranger 1, which means they have plus 20% force attack and defense. The natives also have a base bonus of 25% march attack, 75% jungle attack, 75% force attack, 50% light force attack. Interestingly enough, they aren't actually super powerful in forest on the defensive, which is different in the modified version that I like to play oftentimes. So I think settling here, unfortunately, might actually be a bad move at the moment. But I'm also kind of just forced to do it in a lot of ways, I think, because I don't have anywhere else to go. We've kind of landed right in his heart. This is also a revolutionary difficulty, which means that he's going to attack us very rapidly if we take his land from him. Even our own king is already annoyed of us. I think we have to go ahead and found the settlement and take the land. This playthrough might end very rapidly. And I might have to restart. <laughs> Sometimes you just get some bad starts. And the maps in this game are pretty small. Even the huge map is pretty small. Which is another criticism. I'm not saying that the game is bad. But whether or not it's better than the original colonization is arguable. I remember looking forward to this game and thinking I'm so excited to see all the improvements. And kind of felt like they didn't really innovate that much in this game. It's still fun, but it's not super impressive. I will say the user interface is a lot easier to use than the one in colonization, that's for sure. Let's call this colony Gamble, because we're gambling with our lives. And here, I think we're actually going to switch to a stockade, most likely. I need to also switch Remembrance to a stockade, so we'll do that right now. In the remake, you always generate at least one hammer per turn. In the classic colonization, you had to employ carpenters at the carpenter shop right here to convert lumber into hammers, but here you always get at least one per turn. It's not much, but it is something. So having taken that land from him, he's now minus three, very annoyed. Our colonists, if we have at least two colonists in a settlement, and we have muskets available in the settlement, enough to arm a soldier, they will take up arms if the settlement is attacked. But we only have one colonist in each of these settlements, and only one set of muskets in remembrance. There's a good chance that we're going to have to go to war with Okanastata very rapidly. Which is fine, it makes everything interesting. In Gamble, what I'm going to do is go back and forth between producing sugar and then producing rum. My objective is to make as much money as humanly possible as soon as possible, so that I can get a bunch of colonists rolling. Specifically, the seasoned scout that you see right here. I'm very lucky that he's right there. I'm going to wait until the immigration gets almost until it's full, and I'm going to specifically pick that seasoned scout because you get a lot of money from exploration in this game. You get money both from burial grounds, ancient ruins, etc., which are like goody huts, as well as other things. And you also get money from meeting the natives, as well as experience, map knowledge, etc. He might declare war on us right now. We're about to find out. If he does, my colony will be destroyed. I'll just have to completely restart. Oh, I got lucky. I forgot to do the picking of the season scout, but he got picked anyway. Let's see if we get attacked. Nope, we're lucky indeed. There is a 20 turn grace period where you cannot attack the enemy colonies. I'm not sure about the natives though. Uh, looks like the English have actually decided to set up just south of our location. That is annoying. I think we might have to go very warlike in order to knock them out of the area. I've only got 172 gold on hand. That's not enough to arm a soldier. I'm going to send the ship back with just a seasoned scout and just look a bit, I think. We also don't have enough gold on hand to arm another scout, at least not immediately. We'll see how expensive it'll be once we get close enough to potentially recruit somebody from the immigration pool, which gets cheaper as you get closer on the crosses down here at the bottom. Let's go ahead and make sure that we get the Master Carpenter next. That leaves us with 112 gold, which is not enough to get a scout. Very sad indeed. And the ship is coming back from Europe. We're going to start meeting all the native villages as fast as we can before we get declared on. So let's actually go ahead and take the season scout over there. Oh, they did found right on that location. That's their first colony too. So we'll offload the scout and then we'll have a chat with Itiwa. They give us 496 gold. Very nice. Thankfully, that's not so much gold that I have to take it back as a treasure to our settlement. And then send it back to Europe using a... King's Galleon, which would take half of the gold. And notably, they want muskets. I'm not going to sell them muskets, that is for sure. 100% we are not doing that. With 608 gold, I can get a lot more colonists than what I have on hand. I'm going to wait a little while longer until the immigration bar gets more full. Then I'm probably going to select some more colonists. What I am going to do immediately, though, is select either a scout or a soldier. Gotta think about that. 
I'd really like another scout to search far and wide, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to arm the carpenter as a scout. He's not actually going to be the scout, he's more useful as a carpenter. If you use a free colonist or basically anybody else, and you go to native villages, they can actually season your scout for you and turn them into an expert. Our ship, by the way, has four cargo slots. The other nations only start with a caravel, which only has two cargo slots. So we're automatically better in terms of economics. First, burial grounds gave us a treasure. Very nice. This treasure is worth 1,118. We're only going to get half that, sadly. If we can get a galleon, which is worth 3,000 gold, then we would be able to ship them back on our own. We're not probably going to be able to do that. What we could do to lower the prices of everything, though, is to get the trade founding father. You get founding fathers in this game by generating political points, trade points, religion points, etc. by playing the game, basically. Political points come from liberty bells. Everything else is pretty straightforward, like do military actions to get military points, spread your religion, generate converts, missionaries, etc. to get religious points, and so on. Under trade, there's Peter Minowit gives you minus 25% cost of recruiting units in Europe. That's a fantastic choice. There's also under exploration Juan Ponce de Leon who gets two times as likely chance to get treasure from ancient ruins. He's great. Pedro Alvarez Cabral has half travel time to Europe. He's not so good but I'm kind of torn here because I'd like to get those founding fathers but to get those founding fathers we need to make political points. To make political points you either need to generate liberty bells by using statesmen or using colonists working at the statesmen building the town hall or we can actually build them by using these buttons right here we can turn hammers into political points but i also kind of want stockades in my settlements because i'm very worried once we go to war the natives only have a strength two when they don't have muskets so our soldiers should have like strength five or eight i'm not sure which one it is it's pretty good or maybe three i'm not sure but we're probably going to need stockades to defend ourselves which will be very soon so we brought the treasure to the colony, and now for half of the treasure, the king will transport it using his galleon. We'll take that 559 gold, absolutely. And our ship sails off to Europe. We're up to 867 gold, let's see if we get any gold from Chota. We got 1884, that's wonderful actually. We'll send that immediately over to Gamble. And I kind of think that we're making enough money that I'd like to make Liberty Bells to do political points, which is what I'm going to do. I really want to get those early founding fathers, they're extremely useful, and we're going to get a lot of gold just from the treasures, so we're going to rely upon treasures. Unfortunately, we only got a map there. There are five tobaccos here, that's incredible. We also really want to go toward the English rapidly and take Jamestown from them. That does not look like it's a bad spot, but it doesn't look like it's a great spot. I'd rather found a colony right here with access to the crabs as well as the corn that is underneath the Cherokee village here. There's also a criticism of the remake of colonization and the old colonization in that neither of them really addressed the issue of slavery as well as the hacienda system, which was like the Spanish forced labor system, and the remake of colonization doesn't address it either. We got 1,341 gold. Let's get a petty criminal. We're going to get the criminal some guns. That leaves us with 931 gold. We're going to load up the scout and the soldier, and we're going to buy... A cannon for 500 gold that leaves with 431 gold. I'd like to go ahead and get myself, I think, an expert fisherman, even though I don't have any crosses right now to make it cheaper. We can afford it. We've got plenty of money. Ah, there's another season scout already. I gotta take him first. I have to. So now I'm gonna have two scouts running around in the new world, hopefully. Well, not two, but three. And we'll be making a ton of money from exploration. Oh, I can sell this treasure here too. So that gives me 1,093 gold. This merchant man is already full, so I'm kind of tempted to start expanding my shipping already. And in fact, I'm going to do that. I'm going to buy the caravel. I'm going to load the fisherman onto the caravel. That leaves us with 93 gold. You kind of don't want to have a lot of gold on hand in the remake because the king will come around and he'll ask you for money pretty often. Let's explore this ancient ruins, and I'm going to head north to Great Hiwasi. We got even more treasure. Wow. 1,252. This is actually going to help us out a lot. We're going to need soldiers in order to take down the natives. Ah yes. Before we kill them though, Kitawa trains expert farmers. Chota trains expert tobacco planters. And Great Hawassi, we're going to find out on the turn after this turn. 
Uh, the King of England is already alarmed by rebel sentiment in the, New in the New Netherlands. He has added four units to the Dutch Royal Expeditionary Force. This is a revolutionary difficulty, which means that the King has troops to the Royal Expeditionary Force quite rapidly based on your production of Liberty Bells. So you kind of want to watch out for that. And he does it pretty often. What I'm trying to do is get one Ponce de Leon. Thanks so much for watching dealing with it. I'd really love to hear any feedback you have about the video in the comments below. I think all feedback is good feedback. If you like the video, giving it a like would help the video to reach other people that might also enjoy the video. If you'd like to see more, you can always subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one in episode 2.